wasted money on cures Forgot how to fix myself They say that time is free Then why is it so precious? Oh, I'll say Good evening, everyone. It's Jim here at uh, Tutor Well, as you can tell from the uh, from the screen behind me. Um, the, the good news is I am not answering your questions tonight. I'm just here to see fair play and to help facilitate hopefully what will be a useful discussion for everybody getting ready for Paper 1, uh, QA A-Level Sociology tomorrow. And I'm joined today by uh, left to right, we've got, uh, well, I was going to say Duncan. It's not Duncan. It's another man with a beard. It's Craig, <laughs> joined by uh, Casey and Anna. Good evening. Hello, hello, hello. Good to see you. And uh, by the way, if you like, if you're enjoying this session already, or if you think you might enjoy it, or if you don't enjoy it, click the like button right now to help uh, trigger the uh, YouTube algorithm to suggest this to lots of other students preparing for A level sociology uh, tomorrow. Now the format is about thirty minutes or so. The idea is to try to identify some specific topic or content theory questions that uh, maybe you just need a little bit of help on. No predictions. We've never been in the predictions game, never will be. We'll leave that to others to uh, to play that that ridiculous game. It's all about getting ready for uh, doing your best you can and uh, responding to the questions that the exam paper sets. But hopefully tonight we'll uh, cover a few concepts and topics and uh, get some advice from the team here that might be useful for you. Who knows? Um, Craig, obviously lots and lots of questions coming in. I think we've got one and a half thousand people joining us live. What kind yeah, of themes, what kind quite of, a lot. Uh, and I've picked out one that I think is particularly commonly asked so far mm -hmm. uh, on the live chat so from San Cooley. Yeah. Uh, but it's been asked by a lot. So should we start off with this one in terms of uh, a broad topic area? I'm guessing it's around education. I'll leave it up to you then to see where it goes. Excellent. So, um, so we've got San Cooley start to talk about the difference between marketization and privatization. Um, they're both on the specification. I think it's an interesting one that, that we've put up there. We did do a couple of two, two videos on both marketization and privatization, which we might be able to put 
in the comments after after this one. Um, privatization is largely almost a subset of marketization, really. You may talk about some privatization, uh, some ideas of privatization as a subset of marketization, or you may also talk about privatization as a subset of something like globalization as well. Um, I don't know what, so like Katie and Anna, what do you think? Yeah, I totally agree. So marketization is obviously when a school markets itself, sells itself to mm. the consumers, which are parents, it's, it's students, stakeholders, and then obviously privatization is when uh, the government still funds the education system primarily, but it could be also private enterprise, which um, could be things like, I'm conscious to name check, but certain big brands, technology brands can also sponsor schools as well. But the school is basically responsible for its its funding. Um, and yeah. that they might marketize elements of that because ultimately there might be certain things that they're spending their money on and that could be marketable to parents. So it becomes attractive to parents. So for example, if they have a big, um, software company uh, sponsoring them for argument's sake, that is something they definitely want to promote to their parents. So there is like, as, as Craig said, it's definitely a subset to that. I'm trying not to mm. name check particular schools or um, or particular brands that go with particular schools sometimes, but you might be, be in a school that yeah. has uh, marketization and privatization as an element of that. Yeah, certainly. I mean, with privatization, you've got privatization of education and privatization in education. So mm. if you were to be asked a question, maybe sort of like outline two ways education has become privatized. It's not private schools, it's no. private businesses being involved in schools. So academies is a good example. Um, you know, sort of like the idea that there is a private company that is running the school and is receiving funding from the government. You may see lots of examples of privatization in your own school, things like catering services. Um, we look at sort of like the way in which the exam board essentially private companies as well so they they would certainly be things that you can bring in there yeah i've just seen because i'm not the one saying it but i think it's just scrolled up and miss i think it's miss QT or QT. i can't remember because it just literally went gave me some examples of uh particular brands that might sponsor schools or you know supply some of their resources um there yes. we go um yeah and i didn't want to say it, classrooms so a good example <laughs> yeah i didn't want to but like it's a good example it's a good example of how yeah, schools yeah. have used in that yeah, definitely. Just I know of one school that literally school. only has, uh, like, uh, actually, I think it might be your school, uh, Anna, but literally just has um, their own technology pads. I'm trying not to give a name as well. And that's it. That's all they use. iPads, I think you're so, talking yeah. about, Katie. IPads. Yeah, I'm trying to be, <laughs> I'm trying to be, like, non, like, you know. Other, the other these, them, right? these are good examples. <laughs> A couple yes, of people have exactly. mentioned colorization as well. That is a good example, yes. sort of like a privatization too. Yeah, and there's lots of features. And obviously, you know, like academies is probably the big one, like that you would have would have looked at mm. as well uh, within regards to that and how what the strengths and weaknesses of academization um, might be. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of questions come up about pupil identity. I think that that's something that a few people have been worried about. Please, when answering people's identity question, how do you prevent going off topic and closely talking about class, gender, ethnicity? Well, it depends on what the question is asking you, because it might be asking you about a social class identity, a gender identity or an ethnic identity. Largely, when you're talking about pupil identities, it will be things that also impact on a student's achievement. So things like labelling. Labelling, we know that impacts on students' achievement, but it can also impact on their identity formation. Subcultures. Um, is one that you can use and sort of like say that students, um, you know, when they join an anti or a pro school subculture, when they're differentiated or polarized, this will impact on their identity formation. It's just about applying that and making sure that you link it to identity. Um, likewise, setting and streaming is another good mm -hmm. example. And then you have, yeah, things like subject choice, how girls are channeled into one subset of subjects. You could even talk about subject choice in terms of social class and how maybe working class are channeled into vocational courses. So there's a lot of information that you can use for achievement that you can also then apply to pupil identities. I don't know if uh, Katie, you or Anna would add anything to pupil identities essay. If you've got um, or, or I think question on pupil identity. Go for it, Anna. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I was just going to say that 
if it doesn't specify um, class, gender or ethnicity, then, you know, you can always give examples and be, it doesn't mean you can't talk about them. You can be hypothetical and mm. say like, for example, it may impact their class identity or it may impact their ethnic identity or their gender identity that it wouldn't be wrong to do that if it doesn't, um, if it doesn't specify one of those, you can still do, speak about mm. them as an example. There's a yeah, few good examples right. that are coming through. There's a few good examples coming through. People are talking about um, people like Tony Sewell and sort of how that's um, and how that's how that's in, impacted on on gender identity. Uh, Louise Archer has saw come up as well. Louise Archer's done quite a lot of work on 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 the pupil identities as well. So some people are putting up some um, different theories in there. We want to kind of stick away from specific sociologists in case you've done something different to we have. Um, yeah, mixed ability sets. Yes, that would be a good one. Yeah. Um, yes. I'll say, uh, sorry, just to look at AJ's as question. Well. So, I was to say language as well would obviously have an impact mm -hmm. on identity as well, which then would maybe feed into lab labeling and setting and streaming. So, yeah, I would say, and like mm -hmm. you said, subject choice. There's lots of things in there that we you would probably look at in differential achievement that would shape a student's identity, student mm -hmm. student relation, teacher student relationships as well, idle pupil. Um, yeah. And also, I was thinking, like, the sort of, uh, without thinking of a name particularly, but the sort of crisis of masculinity, sort of the relationship with work yep. and their identity as well. So it's, there is so much. So it should be a case yeah. of just thinking, well, what do I already know about class, gender, and ethnicity? And and then it's yep. that application across. Yes, I mean, even again, sort of like think ethnocentric curriculum, institutional racism, they will mm. impact on somebody's identity, and therefore, I think that's, I mean. It, it, it really is that type of question is about applying your knowledge of sociology and thinking how could that impact on an individual and often we focus on it as achievement but it also will have other impacts on the on, on those students and so i think a pupil identity question and um, there's lots of stuff in there that you that you know it's just a case of applying it to the demands of that question Change of positive and negative impacts of globalization. globalization and education. I know that's been one of the most popular videos that has been watched today. So what are our thoughts, Anna, Katie and Craig on this one? Who would like to start? <laughs> okay, um, I'll go I, mean, uh, um, I was going to say, I don't mind saying something. I don't mind what either, really. I think the key okay. thing is, I think Craig's going to say this, is is lead with your policies. And um, that might be something you want to do. I'm not saying you have to. It might be that you might go with theories of see postmodernism quite links to globalisation as well. Um, it depends. Really, I think the key is, is, is answering the question that's in front of you, because it might not be mm -hmm. a sort of easy application of whether it's a strengths or weakness essay. It might be that if even if globalisation has, has had an impact on education or not. Um, so it is good to know whether there's positives and negatives in globalisation um, on education, but also that it's reading the question that's in front of you, not the question you want it to be. Um, so, yeah, I would personally be thinking positives and negatives and looking at the, pos the policies that have had an impact and the positives and negatives around those, if you sort of thinking, so things like obviously PISA, you may have come across a sort of a standardised testing and how that's had an impact um, on education um, and how that works globally. Um, I know that Craig's not in his head, so I'll, I will pass over to Craig as well and, and to Anna. I think, um, yes, I mean, when you're talking about globalization, the, the, the specification point says the impacts of globalization on educational policy. So some of the policies that have been influenced by globalization, and it's, if you're worried about this question, it's worth writing down five or six of them and, and, and learning them, to be honest with you. Free schools and academies were influenced by other educational uh, provisions. So free schools were influenced by the Swedish free Oh, Craig, yes, Craig's, uh, I think, frozen, but I think, am I still going? Am I the only one? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, keep going. Yeah. Oh, maybe, Anna, do you want to, do you want to dive am in? I know you're about to stop. Yeah, Craig, yeah. you just, uh, Craig, you hold fine Craig. now. You're back with us, but Anna's just about to make a point. Um, No, I was only going to pick up if, um, from what Craig was saying. So it's a good idea to make sure that, you know, you know you've got those um, policies and that you have, thought through for each policy um, what the positive or negative impacts are. So it's not so much generic, like has globalization has an impact, but whether those, what has been the positive and negative impacts of the specific policies that may be because of globalization. I don't know if Craig wants to pick back up what he was going to say. 
there's some people putting through sort of like some good policies so things like master teachers and um, that were obviously introduced um, you can look at sort of like policies that have inf been influenced by globalization so for example um, because of migration in the early, late part of the 1990s early part of 2000 the curriculum became more multicultural and we offered a broader range of subjects um, you can also look at very contemporary ideas i think we mentioned this maybe last week when we talked about the idea that um, now that students may have to study maths until 18, which is clearly influenced by the PISA rankings um, and how um, the UK needs to improve its position in maths. Um, the teaching of primary maths is, has been influenced by the uh, Chinese and Singapore systems. Mm -hmm. um, so there's lots of different ways in which globalization has influenced us, even negative ways. So for example, because of um, globalization, we had we have a period sort of like you know the war on terror and and the in global insecurity that existed that brought about policies like prevent which meant that teachers had to report students for potential radicalization and that's obviously had an impact as well so i would i would suggest if you're worried about globalization and education get six of those policies down oh i think Craig's focusing again. Um, I think someone actually, Evie's put quite a few down, but I think they've they've gone. But basically, I think what Craig was saying was Here the free, are, yeah, free schools, perfect, yeah. excellent. So we've got free schools, which obviously influenced yeah. by Sweden. Um, you've got academies uh, influenced highly by America and sort of standardised testing. We've got PISA, uh, which obviously has influenced maths um, po potentially post six uh, post sixteen compulsory. Um, you've got. Um, I think sort of Craig alluded to it, the subjects and the variation, but you've also got languages, so the emphasis on language or the valuation, that is languages tend to be European languages rather than international languages. Um, you've also, yeah, we've got RE there, which is um, a sort of compulsory subject as well. And I think some of them, I think Craig mentioned prevent. So it's thinking about those, how they've had an impact and the evaluation of those really. Um, the sort of, and then really, the I suppose my alternative debate, which I sometimes like to think about, is is it that that's having an impact on achievement, and is it the aim? Is it doing it successfully? I think there's also that debate as well. That the, there's a positive and negative that also has globalisation had a had an impact on our education system or not. Um, and obviously, I think you mentioned Singapore maths earlier as well, Craig. Mm -hmm. um, just to oh, just to I'm sure you're frozen there again, Sorry. Greg. I'm not sure. <laughs> no, I had my hand up. It just it was just like, um, just to just to add to that, sort of like you know some evaluations. Well, the idea of you know kind of cultural relativism. Can can we actually apply an idea? And you know we're taking ideas from sort of China and Singapore. Are they relevant to be used in the UK? And that could be sort of like some evaluation points that you make. And I just wanted to add, and also Look, you know some knowledge from the other topics like the ethnocentric curriculum you know to the extent is education really multicultural um some people will say the curriculum's still ethnocentric um i know some of the new english lit specs have been criticized for not having ethnic minority authors um so you can you know use think, try and think synoptically as well and bring in some of the points that you've learned from the other topics you would be able to use to evaluate um as well there's a few questions on sociology as a science coming up. Um, I th I yeah, just I'll go get. To, I'll go Hannah get some of those. Up. Yeah, oh, let's go find some of those. You lead us off. Oh, for... Thanks, Evie. I'll say thank you, Evie, for your ideas. They were really yeah, good. So yeah. Superb, wasn't they? Yeah, social as a science. We did that actually on Wednesday. Um, I think I sort of who was it I, I, I yes i looked at sociology as a science and that debate i mean for me i think i alluded to this a, a little bit obviously it'll be a, if it came up on this paper one it would it we could I'm not saying it will we don't know that's the whole thing it would be a 10 marker um obviously the 20 it still could obviously is a 20 marker for paper three um so it depends how it's worded really and i think it's sort of one of those things you sort of think if you know one side of the argument, you know the other side of the argument for it. So it's basically, is sociology a science? Is it not a science? Or can it, can it not be? Um, so it's really looking at sort of the idea of maybe looking at sort of what extent is positivist approaches um, able to be scientific. So you might be looking at sort of the idea of, well, I think Madeline's got it there. You've got uh, Popperman's falsification. We've got Kung. So we've got that idea. So a lot of you are answering this already. Um, 
a lot of schools wouldn't have taught EV the suicide study because that was taken off the spec but you can have it if that makes sense you could have could have used that as an idea um so a lot of you were answering it's really it's really just sort of coming down one side is there evidence to say that sociology can be scientific it's normally through its methodology and its pro approach can it be objective or is it subjective um and like yeah uh, Keys has asked that sort of question related to that it, it can come up because it's a theory and or methods question it isn't a, a situation where you can only get a theory question or a methods question on one paper it can be either or um around that um so yeah it's whether i think whether it can be scientific or not i think we've got some really great answers already coming through um yeah basically i don't know if anna or craig wants to say anything i feel like we've got i missed i missed duncan too myra who who doesn't <laughs> <laughs> i would just say for that one you know just make sure you've thought through two clear ways that sociology could be a science and your relevant evidence and two ways that you, what reasons why it might not be a science and your relevant evidence and um and and then you should be pretty prepared really um you just got to be careful about the question wording and make sure that you are um applying it carefully to the way that the question's worded yeah look who's as you can see duncan chat. is joining us duncan has arrived in the live <laughs> chat can you believe it oh there duncan, he is duncan there is joining go. us he's he's with us in spirit today i think uh, but it's actually, I think it's Emily behind the scenes, he though. wrote an answer as well on there, and someone mentioned value free. So yes, yeah, his idea: can it be value free, or is it value laden? Basically, and what evidence is there for that? But someone also wrote, wrote I think it was Emily P, gave some answers as well within there. Craig, have you got anything else you want to say? I don't know about social science. No, I think we've covered that one. Um, there's just to, there's lots of people asking about specific sociologists, so um uh con um compt popper people asking about those specific sociologists they they come up with different sort of kind of concepts in that sociology as a science debate right i i, mean, I think sort of like if we, we're very wary of sort of like getting people to be worried about sort of like a specific sociologist but they are ones that uh, put forward ideas in those different debates and it's worth having a look at that um overnight but don't worry specifically about um about those things there oh i think we've lost anna it's okay we'll get her back yeah yeah it's just, it's just... Oh. we'll get her back keep going we'll get her back keep we're going. still streaming <laughs> we're still streaming I'm not, sure I'm not quite sure what was going on there. I'm not quite but, sure what was um, going on okay, there. So, but, um, oh, okay, so... Oh, I think there's an echo. Oh, I think there's an Sorry. echo. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, so we're going to have to try and get We do, yeah. We've got a little bit of an echo coming in. Oh, oh can we still go? Oh, we're we're still good to go. Off we, we go. Keep going. Yeah, Jim, Jim's, in, Jim's <laughs> in the background. Um, right, okay. So can we explain Giddens' structuration theory? That's a good one, I think, um, that we can look at. Structuration theory is the kind of idea that where you're combining social action and structural approaches that they cannot exist without each other. There is a concept that we call duality of, uh, duality of structure that we, you know, individuals shape society, but society shapes individuals. And essentially, that is what structuration theory looks at. Okay. Um, we've we've kind of looked at globalization already. Uh, we, we've sort of like also mentioned kind of not going, oh we've doubled up Katie. Um, <laughs> that we've um, that kind of we, we're not specifically making predictions. Can could sociology of science come up in paper three? Yes, it could potentially come up in paper three. It's in the theory of methods. It can come up on paper one and paper three. Uh, it could come up as a ten or a twenty marker um, in that one. Um, let's see do we need examples of researchers for the methods in context session there's a few people asking about methods in context um the idea would be is that you you could potentially go off into long descriptions about a study that is not really linked to the question so you do not need them to get into the top bands right if you know that a certain theorist has used the method that is named and you can identify some of the problems that they may have had when they were conducting their research, then that is a very good way of showing application. But you don't have to just throw in a specific piece of research. 
So a few years ago, um, there was a question on the field experiments and um, labeling of students and Rosenthal and Jacobson had done that study. And so some students might be able to use that and sort of like say, well, one of the issues that Rosenthal and Jacobson would have had um, was defining, you know, sort of operationalizing um, pupil achievement, for example. And so that would be a really good use of it. What would not be the greatest use of it is if you said Rosenthal and Jacobson did this, they found this, that's it, because you're going off on a tangent, you're answering a different question. Okay, can we go over the new right in education? Okay, there's a question there. Can we go over the new right in education? I don't, I mean, I'm happy to do that. Um, new right, basically, um, like, I mean, I, when I think of new right, I think they're really useful for the relationship between um, marketization and education. I think of new right a lot for when you're gonna be talking about policies. Um, also for sort of the function of education and preparing for work. So basically it's the idea that education creates competition and therefore raises standards. Um, so you're mm -hmm. thinking about all the policies that do that, uh, particularly the marketization policies. And I'll be thinking about the sort of, I suppose the role of education preparing people for work, supporting the, the functionist idea um, as well. And yeah, I mean, I know people put in names, but that's basically what Chubb and Mo basically say. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, Anna, I don't know if you want to add yeah. Uh, yeah, I would just say that um, it's the idea that, so the new right believe that education should have similar functions to functionalists, but that they're not being achieved. So I think it's good to be clear, you know, if you were going to be doing a theory essay that, um, that that's the difference between functionism and new right. They think marketization is the solution in terms of helping education to achieve those functions like meritocracy, preparing you for the workplace. So they agree with what the functions are, but they disagree with functionists that they're being achieved and they think marketization is the is the solution to that there was a question a few moments ago about timings um, and a couple of people have put that up there as well um timings generally um what i don't know um what you to uh, what, what yeah, yourself katie and anna, anna would sort of like say but i always go by a minute and a half a mark so roughly for your four and six yeah. marker, yeah. So um, your for your four and your six marker combined, you'd probably spend fifteen minutes. Um, for your yeah, ten marker, say, maybe fifteen they, minutes. Sorry, yeah, I would just. I usually tell. I usually think that mine. By the time they get to the exam, they can normally do the four and six um, in less mm. time than that. So I always encourage them. I think normally you can bank a few minutes from those, which I tend to recommend. Certainly, you say yeah. for methods in. Because sometimes that takes a bit longer to to process and plan. So I kind of encourage them to maybe try and do the four and six in t 10 or just under and then bank a few minutes for the 30 and the 20 marker. Yeah. yeah and so with the 20, for your 20 mark methods in context, that, that roughly would be 30 minutes. But as Anna was saying, if you've banked a few minutes earlier on, it could be 35, 40 minutes. Um, likewise, with your 30 marker, probably about 45 minutes. And the, and the other 10 mark question, probably about 15 minutes as well. I just want to add sort of a point around sort of the, the questions is do, do, move on sort of thing i think that if you do if you do decide to do the, the paper in order as it comes you know just keep an eye on the marks especially with the, the four the six and the ten it's especially if it's something you know feel comfortable about it's really easy to, to turn them accidentally into an essay and obviously whatever you do it doesn't matter how much you write you're going to get capped aren't you at four marks six marks and ten mm -hmm. so just be mindful of the time even if it's something you feel confident with and you feel like oh, i want to add loads to that really it will just get capped to that point so you need to be doing your 10, your, your 30 markers, your 20 and so on. You just need to make sure you approach every every question and just move on. Allow a little space if you want to, to add more to it at the end, um, definitely. Yeah, and I'll just add, you know, it's better to do a little bit of every question and leave something out because it's really easy to get those first one to three marks on, on any question. So if you really are running out of time, it's better to just leave one of them unfinished and do a little bit of the last one and have something down for everything rather than loads for one and nothing for another so just try to make sure you've got something written for every question even if the clock is running out on you okay there's a couple of questions here particularly about social action theories 
um, and then pot potentially look at sort of like post-modernity. So is there a question there on social action theory? <laughs> it's quite a few people have asked for social action theory. Mm -hmm. um, social action theory was, um, it was the focus sort of like of last year's B20 mark question. That doesn't mean it can't be a, a 10 or a 20 this year, but social action theories largely are things like interactionism um, and labeling theory um, and, and the kind of works of, of Max Weber, for example, the dramaturgical approach. These are some of the concepts that you might use. If you're getting that question, uh, it might be something like criticism as a 10 mark, it might be criticisms of social action theory. And, you know, there are lots of different criticisms that we, we, that we could possibly expand on. So things like it tends to focus on um, sociological issues which don't have um, greater relevance to wider society. That's one criticism of social action theories. Um, some you might in, you might impact, so you might um, criticize things like labeling theory for being incredibly deterministic. Um, there's different things like that. Do we need to differentiate between social action theories and our response? I think that depends on the, on which type of question it is, but largely, as we've said, our social action theories that you're really concerned with is labeling theory and symbolic interactionism and maybe some Weberian sociology as, as well. Lots of people are saying in the thingy, what about ethnomethodology and phenomenology? I don't want to panic people about ethnomethodology and phenomenology because you can get into the top mark bands without mentioning them. So if you don't know what they are, do not worry. It's not likely you're going to get a 20 mark I've question just, on ethno methodology. I just, yeah, I was about to say, I've just seen you have learned about social mm. action theory. So, all the stuff you've done in education on subcultures, mm -hmm. labeling, if you've taken culture and identity and you've looked at Cooley, which I know someone, someone's called their self looking class self, um, so people yeah. talk about Goffman and the dramaturgical model. You have looked at, you might have not looked at under the umbrella of social action theory, but it's everything like, yeah, basically, Evie again answers this question for us. I hope you're thinking of coming as doing sociology at university. <laughs> is is all those things interpretivism, labelling? We've looked, you've mm -hmm. looked at all of these already, and so it just comes under that umbrella. It's the idea that us as individuals have are able to shape the environment that we live in. We're able to shape society. So it's the opposite of structural theories, which are your Marxists, your functionalists. Okay, um, it's that idea that you can have a say around it so i think a lot of you've answered this already like in the chat so yes you have you've covered it you might have just not thought oh it's action sometimes you might refer to it as micro maybe or or bottom up mm -hmm. yeah uh, the other one we talked is a lot of people have been asking about is about post-modernity okay i think there's a question up there about post-modernity is that coming up um what do postmodernists say about education? It's um, very simple. I mean, it's very simple. You'd probably use postmodernity in education as as almost like as a critique. You're not going to get a thirty marker on postmodernity in education. It might be that there is greater choice, there's greater diversity in the education system. Um, there's not. They're not specifically named on that. Postmodernity in the debate of late modernity. That that's an interesting debate. I'll I'll let you on you two take that. Um, so I suppose the question I'm thinking you're, that might, you know, the, the around that would be something around, do we live in a postmodern society? So it'd be outlining the same two ways in which we do and we don't. Um, so the idea of late modernity is when we're not, we're not postmodern yet. So it's the idea of risk society, mm. potentially, you might have looked at risk flexivity. Um, it's that idea with postmodernity, obviously things you've looked at already, which might be things death and meta narratives, um, pick and mix. I'm trying to think of all the, now I'm thinking of all my postmodernity topics, uh, fragmentation. So it's a lot of the stuff that the sort of core concepts of it's the debate on whether we are or mm. not globalization, obviously. Um, and a lot of it, a lot of it goes through sort of like a lot of the optional modules that you, you may not have revised mm. for yet, particularly when you think about sort of like the way the family has changed its structure and mm. the way in which we access religion has changed massively. Um, in, even in terms of in terms of crime, how crime has become sort of like incredibly fragmented, and and um, people are looking for for you know there are newer explanations for why people commit crime other than relative deprivation. So I mean, post modernity in the debate about late modernity is a good one. It came up a, a few years ago. Value outline explained two ways society can be seen as having having entered a postmodern age. Um, 
and it's it's worth having a look at sort of like some sample answers for that because that's what it picked up uh, that's what they picked up on with with postmodernism. Mm. I mean, I think the key thing right. is knowing. I was about to say some sort of the alternative argument when you come to evaluation, but um, remember, I think this is something that sort of Craig alluded to just then. Is remember, and I said this the other day when we did our, our live on Wednesday. That methods question or theory question on paper one, you can use anything, and I keep saying this: anything from anything from crime, whatever your optional topics are, to sort of support that argument. So. Any of the, and like you said, anything from beliefs, if you've done beliefs, if anything from media, anything like that, you can use in order to support that argument. We either live or, or if that came mm -hmm. up, live or do not live in a postmodern era. So, you know, there's so many concepts that come out of what you've already learned. There is a. Yeah, and also global, like, globalization oh. as well as a feature of postmodernity. So, all the stuff you've been trying to think about for education and globalization, you'd be able to use globalization as an example of that and draw on the same evidence if you needed to. Mm -hmm. yeah. Also, within postmodernity, there's a couple of people, um, there's a couple of people sort of like who've put up comments in there. So, um, the idea of the decline of meta narratives, mm -hmm. um, how That's society it. distrusts experts nowadays how um you know we see science as being a problem it's created social problems there's lots of other things that, that you can put into post-modernity just what i want to pick up on there's a lot of people asking about value freedom and value laden in sociology um, and i think it's worth looking at, at some of these kind of ideas about how sociologists values might influence um, their research um thinking about some of the practical ways in which sociologists values um, sorry, thinking about some of the ways in which sociologists' values can influence their research is things like their theoretical approach. So are they a Marxist? Are they a feminist? Of course, that means that they are usually going to side um, in terms of inequality with with, with the, um, the subservient group. So, for example, Marxists will always side with the working class, feminists will side with females. Um, their methodological approach, some will see, um, some positivists will want, so, uh, will want their research to be objective um whereas interpretivists look to actually extract meaning and therefore are more subjective and therefore it's more value laden there are some other parts to that debate as well i don't know if katie or anna um would like to kind of add to those yeah um yeah the stuff on um value commitment um and becker and mm -hmm. Goldner and the idea that that's the point of sociology um mm -hmm. is to um use your values to change the world and this is where there's a bit of an overlap with social policy as well if you were going to maybe get a 10 marker on social policies you know about what is the point of sociology um and using sociology to change the world and i always think probably the easiest example is maybe a theory like feminism because you've got examples of actual policies like the equal pay act or mm -hmm. the sex discrimination act that you could use as examples of how um sociologists have used their values to improve society and make it better or to influence social policy and that would over you know you could use the same material for either question i think yeah there's a couple yeah. of good examples there so like somebody said giddin says sociologists can't be value free there's quite a few sociologists who've said that sociologists yeah, cannot be value free as anna's just mentioned Goldner and um, becker suggests it as well weber suggests that sociologists themselves can't be value free but their research can be if they are more objective. So Ella Grace has sort of said, was it Giddens who said sociologists cannot be value free? There's lots of sociologists who would say that. I think Rose has just come through saying Becker believes in taking the side of, of the underdog, uh, which is very much something that, that there was a kind of debate between Becker and Gouldner about that. Um, yeah, and I think I, don't know if I was about to, I was going to say, like with the going back to what Anna was saying about the, the policy, um, this idea of being for the people that believe in being value laden, it's also that it's a good thing because you end up through your methodology to be able to build a rapport, you'll be able to, as as Becca said, get the side of the underdog, really pull on that rich data that gives that meaning and motives, which you potentially can't do if you're value free. Um, so there's a, not only the idea of whether you can or can't it's whether you should or shouldn't as well so um and that's sort of building what anna was saying around sort of the that commitment and being value committed to your research it's it's not only makes social change but also actually enables those people to do that type of methodology to get richer more in-depth data okay can we pick out uh, a couple more that are just there sort of questions that are coming through 
Um, the different theories, positives, negatives of Marxism, feminism. Okay. Strengths and weaknesses of feminism. It has never come up apparently. Okay. Um, I think if you get a feminism question, it'd be interesting to sort of see how they phrase it. If it's phrased as contributions of feminism to our understanding of society, or whether it would actually go into the specific groups within feminism. So I would suggest, certainly suggest that if you get a feminism question, you a you can use your knowledge of feminism from right across the specification on this paper. It's not limited to education. Um, I would also suggest that maybe contrast. Um, if you get something like I'll explain two contributions of feminism to our understanding of society, contrast and sort of like talk about liberal and radical, perhaps two different ways to make sure you get those marks. Um, I don't know about Katie and Anna. What I don't were you? What would you say with feminism? Yeah, I, you know, it could be something like reasons why feminism is still necessary in contemporary society. Mm -hmm. And again, I would think about that in terms of different types of feminism um, and, you know, being quite clear on, you know, what the issue might still be for radical feminists, what maybe Marxist or liberal feminists might still think are the important issues that need to be addressed or different feminists might say, why do we still need feminism because of specific groups mm -hmm. of women are still disadvantaged. So I think, yeah, what you said about thinking about the different types of feminism, I think that's a good way as well to make sure you've got two distinct paragraphs as well, like that are not mm -hmm. overlapping, is to try and think about it like that. There was a question a few years ago, just thinking about that feminism question, um, that, that there was a question about, uh, uh, I'll, I'll explain two criticisms of functionalism. And I think lots of students automatically thought functionalism and education, but it could be from anywhere. So if, it, if you got something like, outline and explain two criticisms of feminism, again, as, as Anna's just said, and as I said earlier on, it might be, well, let's have a criticism of liberal feminism, let's have a critical criticism of radical feminism, and that they could be good ways in which to do that. And you can apply that from right across the spec. Strange thing with the specification is often, in many areas, it doesn't tell you you're learning feminism, but when you're looking at gender differences, you usually are studying feminism. So um, the gender differences in education, gender differences in crime, there's a lot of feminism in there. And, and you know, you can apply that in there. So people like Pat Carlin, Francis Hyden's own, um, within education, you've got like sort of Sue Shah, um, people, even like people like Louise Archer describes herself as a post-structural feminist. So there's lots of different pieces of research that look at gender, which are feminist, that you can apply to those type of questions as well. Yeah, I mean, as Lauren said, and um, it's just come up, it, like I said earlier, the theory and methods question, you can talk about the family in that. It's only a 10 marker. If it's appropriate, obviously, you don't want to go waffling on about something that's just particular to the family as an example. But if you want to show the argument of patriarchy, so like, I don't know, the usefulness of it, then maybe you might want to talk about sort of understanding sort of the triple shift maybe within COVID and still how it's used, still useful today to talk about it um, or it's actually almost like quadruple, mm. it was like quadruple shift really. Um, so if it's still useful in contemporary society. So yes, as if it's applicable, pick out anything and you know your feminist concepts. So you, what you've got to think is, I, you probably could write a list of about 15 feminist concepts off the top of your head now that you could probably use for that question. And you actually only need two of those really for that 10 marker. Okay, just want to pick up on methods in context. A few people asking about methods in context. Oh, any last minute tips, suggestions for the end? The end of... Actually, Craig, we'll come back to that one. I'll favourite that. Uh, okay. Maybe that's a nice way to finish. But do you want to go through uh, methods in context? Yeah, I mean, with, with methods in context, uh, the most important part of that methods in context is that you are focusing on how that specific research method is used in that educational context so think about who you might be researching so are you researching parents are you researching teachers how might using a specific method impact on a certain group and how might it impact on a certain topic so for example we did something on 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 wednesday in in our live stream where we talked about well material deprivation that could be problematic to investigate using um, unstructured interviews because people might become upset um, about their uh, th about their economic situation um, and therefore they may not want to take part and that can have a negative impact or it could create a sample bias. The only people wanting to take part would be middle class parents, for example, who wouldn't feel as, as sensitive about that. Um, the applications, just looking at um, uh, Luana's question here, 
applications to methods and context are usually drawn from the education that you've already studied. So the contexts are usually based on things that you've already studied. So for example, last year it was about subject choice. So how might you investigate subject choice? Um, year before, it was, there was a previous year where it was teacher labeling. It's been pupil behaviors. It's, it's you applying your knowledge of sociological research methods to your knowledge of education. So you've learned both parts of those and, and therefore, um, that, that's what we mean by the applications of the methods in context. So are we going back to that? Sorry, anybody else on methods in context? I think you've said it quite really, really well. I think, it, you know, I would say, <laughs> I think another sort of around that is put yourself in, I think, I know you said this before, is put yourself in the researcher's shoes. So like if you're just, and use the two things, use that item, because the item will have like generally strengths and weaknesses with using that method generally within within education. And then that can start you on a, on a journey about putting it into the context of what, the questions asking you whether that's you know like last year uh subject choice but put yourself in that sh the shoes of the researcher you know what might be an issue of carrying that piece of research out okay we have discussed globalization quite a few times and um, we also kind of we're not going to talk about predictions we, we don't make predictions we're all about preparing rather than predicting um got last to, minute so, tips Craig, we yeah. give for the overall paper yeah, Craig, it's Jim here. And uh, maybe it's uh, one for Anna and Katie and yourself just to sort of finish off yeah. the last two or three minutes. Obviously, no predictions. We don't do that. But uh, any last minute uh, tips about how to handle the paper, the structure, any any advice that you're giving to your students before they uh, they take the, the exam tomorrow? Do you want to start off us off, start us off Anna? Sure. Um, I would say just read the questions carefully, um, particularly, well, all the questions, but also just be mindful of things on the four and six marker, like, if they're mentioning um, cultural factors or material factors or, you know, class or ethnicity, just make sure you are carefully reading, you know, all the words in the question. You're not missing something important like that it's being very specific that you have to talk about cultural factors or internal or external factors. Um, so I'd say read the questions carefully, you know, a couple of times. Um, don't um, panic. Um, don't get too hung up. And, you know, if you can't remember the names of sociologists, you know, try to think about which theoretical perspective they're from. Are there any key terms or concepts that you can use? You know, don't spend a lot of time sitting there trying to remember names. If anything, just leave a little gap, write what you're writing and see if you can come back and fill it in later. But, you know, try and make sure that you are talking about which theories think things and using as many concepts as you can, even if you, you know, you're having a bit of a brain block um, on the names of sociologists. Um, and again, like I said earlier, just make sure you've written something for every question, even if you, you are running out of time. Um, and if you're aiming for top mark bands, um, make sure you've done a conclusion for your 20 and 30 markers. Um, Katie? Um, I would say, I would definitely echo what Anna's just said. I think the main thing is to have an early night tonight, okay? You know, that's what I would say. Like have bath, shower, have an early night and get some sleep. Sleep's really important. Have a good breakfast. Another top tip is do not talk to the person about what they put in the exam. I know the temptation is either to go on, you know, some sort of social media tomorrow after the exam or speak to your friends. The nature of sociology, we've, we've tried not to talk much about names today, is everyone's essay is going to be slightly different. So ultimately, it doesn't mean that your essay is wrong because yours is different to someone else's. Um, another top tip is a lot of the answers will be in your items. We talk about mining the item a lot. So go through the item. And from that, you will have probably, if you're thinking about your 30 marker, you're really going to have probably four or five paragraphs from that that you just then will bounce off. Um, and the same with the methods in context as well. There will be that, and obviously you need to use your item for your 10 marker. So you're, a lot of the time the answers are with the, within the item to get you going. Um, and then probably the third thing I would say would be um, just like a lot of students do this is, is it, it's called blurting, but write down everything that you know in, in relation to that question so that you sort of have a little mind map as you go along um, and then go through the paper so you sort of feel like you've dumped the information down. The only thing I would say is don't cross that out, okay? Just don't cross that out because, you know, 
I think the temptation because it might get looked at um, as in consideration. But the main thing, it's well-being. Go to bed. You know, what's the time now? Not, okay, you're you're not going to go to bed at seven o'clock. That's unrealistic. But Stuff, don't don't get yourself in a frenzy about all the stuff that's been put on there. Um, I, I just now, like you know, have a little chill out, have a bath, have a shower, and get an early night. And um, I wish you lots of luck. Yeah, uh, Katie, I would agree with everything that you and Anna have said. I was going to focus on the item, particularly for that methods and context question. There is loads, loads of little things to to, um, to pick up off that that will kind of fire your imagination. The 30 marker as well. Um, there may be something in there that, that, that might throw you a little bit. But what I would say is, is that use your own knowledge, use the knowledge of the item. Um, the other thing I would say is when you're evaluating this, just make sure that it is expl it is linked to the point that you've just made. And um, think about analysis and the process. So like talk about the process. How does it work? How does this happen? How does A lead to B? And continue to kind of do that consistently through, through your essays. Uh, and just like everybody else has said, I wish you all the best of luck. And hopefully we will see you um, for our paper two sessions that are coming up this week. If we haven't got through to some people, sort of like are asking for specific concepts, I don't know if Jim can put some of the links to the the videos that we've done on those specific concepts into the into the comments after we're finished. So yeah, people are asking about paradigms and paradigm shifts and things like that. Yep. We have done loads of videos on theory and methods and education. So if there is something you do not understand, we've done them in nice little short five minute bursts. Um, so you can you can quite easily revise them and go, right, okay, yeah, I know that now. So we haven't got through all of uh, all of your questions, which I'm really sorry about, but you know, there's over a thousand people in here and lots of people are asking these questions. Yeah, totally agree. And um Thank you very much to uh, to Anna, Katie, and uh, Craig for taking time out this evening. And uh, I'm I'm not on screen at the minute because my camera's broken, <laughs> but uh, I'll I'll echo what uh, our three team has said. All the best tomorrow. Go well. Uh, we'll put some links onto the comments as soon as this live stream is finished. You'll see it in the comments feed. And uh, well, all the best, and we'll see you the other side. So thank you all. Oh, Cheers. Take yeah, care, best of luck. Good luck, everyone. Bye.